Hi, this is Justin Shubo with the National Civic Art Society. And despite my better judgment, <clears throat> this is U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. I'm George Smart. Nowhere in the world celebrates modernism better than Palm Springs, California. Every February, they have a huge architecture and design festival called Modernism Week, which actually lasts 11 days. Modernism Week is a dazzling spectacle of detailed exhibits, shows, architecture, martinis, movies, more architecture. It's really incredible. About 150,000 attendees came this year, but you never felt like it was crowded anywhere that you go. If you're into mid-century modern, this is the top of the game, the Olympics of the architecture we love. And we were there during Modernism Week, talking with nearly all the keynote speakers, authors, and special guests. I'm Tom Gild. I came along with George. It was my first time at Modernism Week. And the coolest thing there is the double-decker buses that they bring in. Oh, yeah. You can ride around always on the double deck because these houses that they drive you by, a lot of them have low walls around them. But if you're on the second level, you can peek over the walls and see things that maybe you're not otherwise going to see. The pool, usually. Right. Anyway, that was just a really neat thing, the double-decker boxes, a must-see part of Modernism Week. Fortunately, during Modernism Week, most of the nudists uh, put all their stuff away. Support for U.S. Modernist Radio comes from Realtor Angela Roll, your special real estate agent for bringing modernist design expertise to buyers and sellers. Reach Angela at AngelaRoll.com, that's R-O-E-H-L, or 919-995-0550. Today, U.S. Modernist welcomes two California architects building new modernist houses and one expert who shares how modernism started. Joel Turkel founded Turkel Design and created Next House, a series of prefab modern homes still marketed by the fine folks at Deck House. In 2014, in an exclusive collaboration with Dwell Magazine, Joel launched the Axiom series. That's a line of modern houses that combined sleek modern design with all the benefits of prefab construction, and now he lives in one. Anthony Poon, our next guest, is an architect, concert pianist, artist, and author. He created new ways to build and promote modernist home developments while maintaining design integrity and construction quality. His talk at Modernism Week was about architects and popular culture. There's a lot more than you might think. Then we wrap up with a conversation with Jacques Cossin, associated with Modernism Week from the very beginning and this year's speaker on how modernism got started and made itself popular in the U.S. I first heard about Joel Turkel in association with Dwell's projects of the early, what do you call them, aughts? The yeah. early aughts. People are calling them the aughts. The aughts. That's that millennium after all our computers were supposed to crash at Y2K. Right. But That's didn't. Right. And Dwell Magazine decided they were going to do something innovative uh, that hadn't been done in a long time by a magazine. And that was to sponsor some real houses by real architects with real innovation around the country. And Joel was one of those. So you found a real architect? We did. We found one. Yeah. Darn. There's more than one. <laughs> And Joel, tell us about how you and Dwell connected to start that project. Sure, yeah. So that would have been, I want to say, 03 or 04. It is just after kind of the Dwell Homes competition, uh, which had been won by Resolution 4 Architecture, a couple of great guys out of New York. And they were looking to kind of expand a series of offerings of homes. And I believe Dwell hosted something called Prefab Proactive, which was a seminar intended to get like-minded people together and see if they couldn't turn this into something a little bit larger than uh, just a competition. And I had been working at that point for several years and was the creative director at that point of a company out in Massachusetts called Deck House. And Deck House was this really cool uh, company that Been around a long time. Been around a long time, since the 50s. 
prefabricated architecture, really. They had a beautiful building system. They prefabricated some really cool houses and been around a long time. Really and strong houses, too, like, you know, muscular houses that were really well built. Well built, great materials, <laughs> you know, open post and beam construction. You know, you oftentimes hear about all the great things people like Eichler were doing out here on the West Coast. Well, on the East Coast, you know, people like Tech House, which had kind of spun out of Tech Built, which you may have heard of. Oh, sure. Um, that was this great company that probably did, you know, 10 or 12,000 houses over a 40 or 50 year period. So, you know, a substantial body of work. And I came to them in the late 90s and um, I thought, why aren't we doing more beautiful, modern prefab houses instead of trying to make things look like McMansions, which is kind of where they had gone at that point. Uh, and so I was encouraging them to try to recreate things along the lines of their earlier work, the tech built, Craig Elwood homes, things yeah. like that. Yeah. I remember being told by an older gentleman working there when I showed him some imagery of a Craig Elwood house. He said to me, you know, if you think that garbage is going to sell, you got another thing coming. <laughs> and I said, I know it's going to sell because I'd buy it. <laughs> and uh, fortunately, anyway, so to make a, a long story shorter, we, we attended a conference, met some of the folks at Dwell, put our heads together. And within a handful of months, I was uh, coordinating a program along with some of the guys at Resolution 4, Charlie Laser, some other people around the country to design a group of homes which could be fabricated, sold, and assembled by deck house. Yeah. And we did that. And we created a group of homes and we built dozens of them. And then uh, the crash came. Ah, and the crash. The crash. Yes. And things shifted. And, you know, the dwell home survived and reincarnated in other forms. But the real thrust of it, I think, was to try to bring good systems built architecture to a broader audience. Sure. And that has been kind of a core principle of our practice since day one. And we started our practice, my wife Milena and I, about 11 years ago, believing that what we could do was take a high quality architecture that could be prefabricated and take that to a much broader audience and ideally take it to an audience that traditionally lacked access to architecture, you know, build anywhere. And that's something that we've done uh, over the years that we're very proud of. We've now built in, I believe, 22 states and okay. seven Canadian provinces. So what we do is try to make it accessible uh, in a way that uh, it really hasn't been on a broad scale before. And so is it accessible in terms of, I mean, the designs are, are great. I've seen them. But how do you make it financially accessible to somebody? Because the prefab mm -hmm. has always been the unicorn of architecture. Sure. Everybody wants to come up with more efficient ways to produce them at a lower cost so more of the average people can get into them. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, a lot of these things sometimes are just you know similarly priced versions of what's been out there. So how did sure. you guys solve this problem? Well, I don't know that we're trying to solve a problem of making this a cheaper version of something that's already out there. Mm -hmm. um, for me, prefab is about predictability. It's okay. predictable cost, it's predictable timing, and it's predictable quality. And those are things that make building a custom home for yourself much more palatable. You're right. A lot of people want prefab to be the unicorn. They want mm -hmm. it to be cheap and beautiful and accessible, which is you know, a fantasy. Yeah. Uh, it was kind of a fantasy when Eichler was doing it because, yes, those homes were perhaps approachable to people, but they weren't exactly cheap for what you were getting. Right. And uh, I think people have a dream of that happening. And people oftentimes say to me, how come prefab has failed? And I say, it didn't fail. It's wildly successful. It's called a mobile home. What you want is sexy, high quality architect -y prefab for the same price as a mobile home. And uh, that, yes. that doesn't exist. Yeah. Yeah, it's too bad the mobile home manufacturers haven't really caught on to modern yet. A few. I think there was one in Tennessee. Can you imagine how bad it would years? be if they did, though? <laughs> well, yeah, a mobile home that's modernist would have to have a lot of glass. True. <laughs> And yeah. I guess, you know, you're, since and, your neighbor is three feet away, right. that yeah. might not work so well. It wasn't one of the other hallmarks that it's an asymmetrical floor plan. Or an yeah. asymmetrical structure. I yeah. mean, it would have a butterfly roof or Some it wouldn't just be a, a rectangle. Some glass being pulled down the highway to a new site. Yeah. Might be there would be some logistical issues. Mode. That could be your next project, Joel, is to come up with the unicorn mobile home <laughs> modernist version. 
Yes, all I have to do is uh, find private, you know, venture capital funding and do it for free. Ah, okay. <laughs> voila, unicorn. Bingo. One of your projects you were working on specifically was in our state of North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And tell us about that house. So that was uh, kind of uh, meant to be kind of a show home for the Dwell Homes program that we were doing at Tech House at the time. And that was supposed to be kind of an example of Next House, which Next House was the, was the home that we had come up with internally at Deck House to be part of this group of uh, Dwell Homes. And that home was kind of made interesting by the fact that it, uh, maybe not in a good way, by the fact that we were building it in a community of other homes where they had some ridiculous covenant that said it had to be 5,000 square feet. So it was kind of an example of what we were doing and also the antithesis of what we were doing. We were trying to create smaller homes that live larger, that were more intelligent. And of course, you know, in order to make this happen, we had to partner in a way with uh, a developer who had a piece of land who needed a 5,000 square foot house. So it became this sort of enormous version of what we were trying to do. Yeah, I think it was interesting in the sense that it exposed it to kind of a mid-Atlantic audience where we hadn't really had much exposure before. And it was, you know, an opportunity to bring a lot of people through and kind of show them some of the tenets of the program that we were working on. You know, the, the, the material. A lot of people came yeah. to see that house. Oh, yeah. We had about 3,000 people that yeah. weekend. It was, um, well, yeah, it was where, quite a... Where is it? This is one uh, in Hillsborough, North uh -huh. Carolina. Uh -huh. It's in a little gated community. And uh, I guess there are, what, 20 homes down that road? About, roughly. I would say, sure. And you drive down almost two-thirds towards the end, and there it is, and it's a gorgeous house. We had a tour there ourselves in 2008 or nine. Yeah. And it's 5,000 square feet? Or yep. more. Yeah, no, it's okay. a big house. It's a big yeah. house. That's a so, big covenant. It is. Yeah. Yeah. This was a... Uh, very fancy. It's, it's very pretty fancy, pretty fancy neighborhood. neighborhood. Yeah. Not and all the other houses are stick-built? All the other houses are bigger. Yeah. Okay. This was the minimum. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And stick built, yes. <laughs> so, you know. So it's the little house. In yeah, the yeah. It's it's the little house. The little starter home on the street. <laughs> I'm sure is, is not loved by the neighborhood, but uh. one of the issues that architects face a lot is when they, particularly for residential, is if your client comes in and wants to talk about doing a new home. And let's say they get past knowing you and liking you and respecting you. At some point, they say, oh, well, can we see one of your houses, right? Sure. They want to yeah. go visit. Well, they should say that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I would say that. Yeah, yes. of course. So it's an issue when you've got to call up some of your clients and try to schedule things and things like that. Uh, I would think particularly where you used to live in Cambridge, it's just kind of logistical problem to make that happen. Oh, it is absolutely. And our, our clients are really, you know, far flung. I mean, we're building, you know, throughout the country, you know, in New Zealand, in the Bahamas, in, you know, British Columbia and Florida. So, you know, when somebody says, where can I see one of your homes? I mean, there are many around the country, but of course they're private homes and we're careful about kind of, you know, disturbing our clients and asking to show a home. And we have some clients who've just been incredibly generous and you, you hate to, uh, you hate to pester them too much. You yeah. know, I, I have a very good client who's become a friend who has given us so many recommendations. You know, I called him one time to thank him and I said, do you have a, a minute to speak? And he says, no, I'm too busy writing letters of recommendation for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind uh, of client yeah. you want right, right there. Right. Anyway, he was joking, but uh, no, I, I, I thanked him with a, with a very nice uh, Nebbiola. But no, in, in any event. What's a Nebbiola? Oh, just some luscious wine that he oh, liked. Okay. Anyway, yeah. You know, to that point, though, in seriousness, we, uh, we've wanted to have kind of an exhibition property for a number of years where we could point to and send people to and say, hey, this is, this is something you can come and look at. And that's, of course, what we've done here in the desert in Palm Springs. Where you and, moved? Um, yes, we moved here about a year and a half ago. Uh, we had been, my wife and I have two young girls, and we were in Cambridge myself about 21 years, my wife a little less long. You know, with the nature of our business and it being all over the country and us being able to work remotely fairly well, uh, it seemed like an interesting opportunity. Also in the sense that we've been steadily expanding our West Coast business. California is now a very big growth area for us. We're doing a lot of projects here. And it seemed like a worthwhile endeavor to, you know, try to put something on the ground that we 
could show to people whenever sure. we wanted to, but also to create something that we could really learn from. And so we came up with this perhaps harebrained scheme of creating what we're calling a living laboratory, which is basically a home that we use from design and planning right through post-occupancy studies to learn about our business, how we do what we do, what a home should be, uh, what materials we should be trying, what techniques we should be trying, what things are tried and true that we want to hang on to, of which there are many after this long in the business, but also, you know, where should we be pushing things and how can we show what we feel is really an appropriate home for today's dwelling expectation and for today's, you know, environment. And this home that you've put together is called the Axiom House? Yes. It's, well, the Axiom is the series of homes, the prefabricated homes that our practice has designed. Okay. And this is Axiom Desert House. Okay. So it's one of about a dozen kind of standard plans, if you will, that we have available to clients to choose from. And so I would say about 50% of our business is a client comes to us, sees one of these standard Axiom homes and asks us to modify it for them. And the other 50% is doing custom one-off homes, which we also prefabricate uh, up in Canada, ship worldwide and erect. That was my question was, where's the factory? We have two factories. So we have two licensed factories. One is on Vancouver Island in British Columbia, Uh and the other is in rural Quebec. And okay. um, we chose Canada because, well, we're both Canadian, my wife and I originally, so that was one oh, thing. Oh, Canada. But, uh, that's right. Drop the puck. <laughs> um, no, but we... Um, and one on each coast. One on each coast. So yeah. we wanted to be able to serve both coasts. You, when you're talking about, you know, New Zealand and the Bahamas, mm-hmm. so is transportation an issue? I mean, it's obviously an issue. You'd think it would be, but containerized freight is so inexpensive. It's actually less expensive to ship something from Quebec to the Bahamas than it is to ship it from Quebec west of the Rockies by surface freight. Oh. So you put it on a, you put it on a, put boat, it on a boat up in uh, where, whatever, St. Oh, Lawrence. Three months yeah. later, it's there. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah, not even. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> it's surprising. But yeah, it's uh, maybe New Zealand will take a while yeah. to get, that, get yeah. that down there, but... And you have solved the problem that we mentioned earlier of having to bug your client for this house because you found the ideal family of four. I found the a sucker you wouldn't believe. Yeah. Um, no, so my, are yeah, we my, talking to him? <laughs> yes, oh, you got a bridge for me? Uh, yeah, right. No, my, uh, yeah, my wife and I decided to put ourselves under the microscope a little bit and say, well, let's really, um, you know, if you're looking to do a case study on kind of contemporary living, uh, who better to do it on than yourself, really? Um, and so this what is we like do, Dr. Frankenstein drinking his own potion. Yeah, yeah probably. Right. Yeah, yeah or, yes, exactly. <laughs> So that usually results in uh, death and maybe just divorce. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, but we were, we were good-natured about it and, of course, wonderfully naive a little bit. We began by really kind of examining our lifestyle and how we live, what we needed, and making some over-the-top analyses of, you know, what do we actually need for space? What do we actually need to live in? What are the most important things for us? 5,000 square feet. Well, you'd think. That's the, that's the de rigueur truth but i think many of our clients come to us in you know the story is hey we've been living in this 5000 foot house and we really want to downsize so our our typical home that we do for clients is between i'd say 26 and 2800 it's really a great size for a house and we asked ourselves you know to what degree we could you know push that and um, see if we couldn't create a livable really a great little house as far south at 2,500 feet as we could. We ended up uh, finding a relatively inexpensive lot here, which was capable of having a 4,200 square foot footprint on it, but we wanted to have a big yard. And so... With a know, pool, of course. With a pool, of course, which oh, yeah. you must have here. Yeah. You know, with kids and it's Palm Springs and it's kind of And expected. it's a thousand degrees in the summer. Yeah, so it gets quite warm. <laughs> uh, so anyway, what we ended up with, I think, was uh, an approach which, you know, sort of said, how do we maximize sort of the great room space of the, the shared communal living space? And how do we make that really feel like an extension of the courtyard area? And so the home is just over 2,000 square feet. It's a three-bedroom, three-bath home, plus a little office, a small mechanical room, and then most of the space is dedicated to this 800-square-foot you know, uh, great room. Which is beautiful, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. One of the rooms that I was particularly taken by is the room that you designed for your daughters. Mm-hmm. So this is the most amazing multi-purpose room I've ever seen. So could you explain for people how... 
you can basically raise a child of all ages in there, Mul- multiple children in the same room, allowing for their growth over time. Like even th- like through college, you can you can be used in this room. Sure. Well, we we really that was part of the analysis that we did about, it. and it's not just our family, but family life in general is that you start off, you're a young couple, you have a, a child or two or three in some cases these days, which of course is rare, and then you know they become teenagers and then they go to college and then they leave you alone and you're sitting there scratching. Your head saying, How do I vacuum speak all to you as, as a father of adult children? Yes. Leave you alone? No, they don't do that. All right. Well, they, they, they leave, but they don't leave you alone. That's yes. right. Right. And they leave their mess and they want money. Mm-hmm. And we said, you know, how do we create a home that is going to be a good home for us in retirement, but also a good home for us now and through all these other uh, various phases of life? And so we have a three year old and a six year old today. We really imagine the room as being four possible rooms, so four different configurations. So it is a room that has a large sofa and a big kind of floor area where the kids can play, but it also has bunk beds, Murphy bunk beds that fold down from the wall. And when they fold up, they become a desk. So you could have a sofa in a big room with a desk in it. I I was thinking, like, this was like a Transformers toy, but room size. And the way these beds and desks and everything fold out was amazing. Yeah, and we work with these great folks at Resource Furniture in New York who helped us kind of create a series of designs for the room that you know, kind of maximize every square inch in a way. Because it's not a big room. I mean, we're talking no. about, a, uh, I think it's an 11 by 11 by 11 room. So it has a very high ceiling, but it's not a huge footprint. But when everything's folded up against the wall, it feels like a big space. And that's kind of where the girls can play, do puzzles or whatnot. They can fold the desk down. forces them to keep their desks neat, too. Well, it does and it doesn't because the way the beds fold down, you can leave all the junk on the desk. It's really kind of interesting in that sense. It's neat. But um, no, so you have a room that has a bunk bed for two little kids. And when one says, hey, I'm a teenager now, I want my own room, one of them goes down the hall to the other room. And uh, the other, you know, what's our den, which also becomes a guest room. And then she folds down the queen and puts away the bunks and has a desk and a queen. And then when they go away to college, we fold them all up and we have a guest room that functions as a craft room or study or something for us. So, you know, rather than building a separate function into the house or a separate room into the house to handle all of these things, we asked ourselves, how can we get as many rooms in the home as possible to perform multiple duties and let us live with a smaller footprint? It really is fascinating. Where can people see photos of of the house and also your work in general, Joel? Well, they can visit our website, of course, at turkeldesign.com. You okay. can see many examples of our work. They can also, you know, welcome to follow us on Twitter or Facebook. And, and uh, Turkel Design, T-U-R-K-E-L. Yep. 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 Now, um, since you're going to be your own laboratory rats here, mm-hmm. so is there a planned schedule after Modernism Week of when the house is going to be available for people to see? Well, there is. So we're available um, throughout this week, of course, and yeah. we're conducting our first tours tomorrow through the weekend. Uh, but it's our intention to make the home available by appointment okay. you know, on an ongoing basis for clients to see or potential clients to see. And so I'm sure we'll, we'll create a regular schedule for that. Typically what we've done in the past for things like that is make it available every second Saturday or Sunday or something yeah. like that. Because, um, of course, we'll need to vacate and um, you know have the children pick up their toys or whatnot. <laughs> but I want people to feel a home. I don't want yeah. people to feel, uh, hey, I'm going to see a model. I want them to see a real working, living house. And I, I, I think the home really feels like a home, not like an exhibition piece. But it's, it's meant to um, encourage interaction. So it's not just going to be us living in it and clients or potential clients coming to see it. It's also going to be our staff coming to visit it and live in it for a while. We're trying to organize a program for most of our full-time staff to get out and use the home. And it's also an opportunity for us to invite a client to come try one of our homes for a weekend or something sure. and see you know, how they like it, how, they, how it feels. You can look at the pictures of our homes and say, hey, these are beautiful. I like this. But until you until you touch it you really don't know you need to feel the space and as you know as a design aficionado you know one of the great things of loving design and being a designer is that you get to travel and see design because it doesn't really translate through pictures all that well and that's something that we are going to encourage people to do and the other thing i love about being here is that when you come to palm springs it's usually pretty sunny you frequently have a martini in your hand and you're almost always in a good mood. So, yeah. you know, that's something I want to, you know, spread some joy. <laughs> you know, George, 
Every time somebody mentions a martini in one of these interviews, we should do a shot. <laughs> we should. That can be our new drinking be game. Snockered. Oh my lord, that is a great idea, Tom. Yeah. We're going to take that back to the studio. Okay. okay. All right. Well, you need a sponsor for that. So, we do you know, a vodka company. A vodka sponsor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm going to ask around. Or a yeah. gin company. Yeah, gin, gin that's would true. Be good. Yep. Yeah. Well, Joel, thanks so much for joining us. It's been great. It's been a pleasure to meet you out here this week. And best to you and your family in this house. I've been there, and it's wonderful. Thank you. And I hope a lot of people come and visit. I do, too. Thanks so much for having us. Next up, George talks with all-around Renaissance man Anthony Poon about architects in movies and TV. From Charles Bronson to Wesley Snipes, there are many more than Mike Brady and Ted Mosby. We'll join them at the spacious but occasionally noisy Hyatt Palm Springs Atrium. I really thought I knew about architecture in movies, but this sheet of paper I have in front of us, which is uh, clearly not visible to our listening audience, uh, has about 20 different characters I thought we'd start with and kind of list, because architecture has not made an enormous splash in things. We don't tend to think of the architect being the main character, but it's in more movies than we might think, right? Correct. That was my interest to make this presentation. Most people don't know until I start pointing out that architects have been in hundreds of movies and everyone says, oh, hey, I saw that movie. I remember that guy. And then they start realizing, yes, Michelle Pfeiffer was an architect. Tom Hanks was an architect. Wesley Snipes was an architect. Wait a second. Wesley Snipes was an architect? Wesley Snipes was an architect in Jungle Fever. Oh, okay. We have Steve Martin playing an architect twice. We have Matt Dillon playing an architect in three separate movies. It's it's an ongoing trend. Hollywood has a love affair with architects as oh. characters, both in film and television. I mean, in television, I only knew Mike Brady from The Brady Bunch. Of course. And Ted from How I Met Your Mother. Yes. Are there any other TV architects? Uh, didn't Tom Selleck play an architect as well as... Uh, I don't know Tom Selleck. It was Three Men and a Baby. Oh, right. He would have been an architect in that, in that and movie. And the owner of uh, Mr. Ed, I believe. If I yes, back to my Alan notes. Young. <laughs> wow, wow you, you really go back. Yeah, Alan Young, he just passed away a couple of years ago. That's unfortunate. I think Mr. Ed died quite a yes, ways back. Yes, <laughs> But it really is in movies. It, it's, it's the perfect go-to hero and feature character, whether it's a drama, a romantic comedy, a romance, an action movie, it just seems to be the the perfect character that fits all plots. Well, one movie which started as a drama and kind of views now as a comedy was The Fountainhead. Have you seen that recently? Of of course. It's really a chuckler. It's it's unfortunate. (laughs) It takes the the gravitas of an Ayn Rand movie and has turned it now into a camp cult favorite. It's unfortunate. Uh, but that, that's how movies go. It, it never quite understood the philosophy that Fontainebleau was trying to get across. No. And the lead character? Gary Cooper. Gary Cooper. Yes. Who didn't seem like he was particularly well suited to being an architect. <laughs> he didn't seem like he was an architect. Not in the ones that, that we, we think of, of, of these days. Yeah. Uh, but the interesting thing is he was an architect in an architect movie. It was a movie about architecture. Okay. Most of the movies you see in Hollywood, uh, it's not about the architect being in an architect movie. If you think about Tom Hanks and Sleepless in Seattle, a classic character in romantic comedy, it's a love story between him, between Meg Ryan, and uh, there's not much about architecture. It's not about him building buildings or designing churches and cathedrals and parks and shopping malls. In most of these movies, the architect as a character is actually superfluous to the arc of the story. Well... That would really narrow the list. I mean, how many architect movies are there that aren't documentaries? Very few. Yeah. Paul Newman in The Towering Inferno is playing an architect in a movie about architecture because a building is on fire. Burning down. Burning down. So he has to play the role of an architect. In The Matrix, there is the architect. He's creating worlds, designing them. He's doing it in virtual reality and digital form. Okay. Uh, But that's really... About it. All the other ones that I've studied and researched and presented today, those are movies not about architecture. And one of the things I I did was examine how if there is a lawyer, it is a movie about law. If there's a cop, it's a movie about crime. If it's a doctor, it's a movie about medicine. A banker, it's a movie about Wall Street. But an architect in a movie is usually not about architecture. 
and it's one of the reasons why you can use an architect. It's a character that is romantic. It gives gravitas. It gives you a creative person that is in a profession. It's idealistic. It's it's sort of a go-to, good-natured person that represents something that everyone can associate with. Easy to write a script around that. Exactly. You you need to write a script. You need to choose a profession. If you made that person a、uh, homeland security officer, I think that would add a different kind of arc to the story.、Yes. If it was romantic comedy and you're making the person a, a therapist or something like an investment banker, I think it would change the course of the movie. But an architect stays safe and neutral. There hasn't been like an action adventure series with an architect yet, I don't think. The one odd one is Charles Bronson in Death Wish. Was which, he an architect in Death well, Wish? Well, and and that's the thing. Some people would say, well, that doesn't fit my analysis of the <laughs> the the nice, romantic, idealistic, creative professional. But it actually does. It is a movie that is extremely violent. Yes, a lot of action, <laughs>、uh, many sequels. And he's seeking revenge for something, right? He's seeking vengeance for being framed for the murder of his wife. Okay. And to make his character take the full 180 into the dark side, he starts as the mild-mannered architect. That's how、uh, it works. So he does again represent all the things that Hollywood thinks architects are, and that's why when he transforms into the vigilante, it's even more dramatic. It wouldn't be as dramatic if he was already a police officer or a detective, sure, or something like that. Well, let's go through some of these other ones here because these characters I didn't I didn't all recognize. What's well, this one? Well, that's Mr. Brady, of course,、okay. the iconic、yes. uh, family architect. It's great. The TV series shows him working at the office with drawings, and also has a, a charming home office. It's one of the funny things, though. A lot of Hollywood represents architects as being wealthy.、Uh, they may be affluent, but most architects actually aren't rich. I think it's funny that that Mr. Brady, as an architect, can support a family of six. He's also paying spousal support because he's divorced. Yeah, his wife doesn't work, and they、There's、have a housekeeper, a housekeeper full time、yeah. living named Alice. So that's、yeah. pretty fun. <laughs> yeah,、uh, one of my favorites is Indecent Proposal with Woody Harrelson. He he plays a young starting out architect giving. Well, this is the one with Demi Moore Demi and Robert Moore, Redford. Correct. And he was an architect in that. He they、wow. even show him teaching. He's trying to quote Louis Kahn. Uh, not quite getting it right, actually. They they modified it. They show him sitting on the floor, drawing on the wall, that kind of creative passion that you have. But because he's a struggling entrepreneur, like many young architects, it makes Demi more more susceptible to the fact that she can get a million dollars by sleeping with a stranger. Yeah. And Wesley Snipes, tell me about that movie. Jungle Fever. Okay.、Uh, it's it's great because first of all. Hollywood in previous decades thought of architects as as being your typical white corporate male. Yeah. So Wesley Snipes breaks that role, as well as other architects that come shortly after that are female, that are younger, of different races.、Uh, Wesley Snipes, it's great. They they use the architect office as a very sexy backdrop. It has the drafting tables, the desk lamps, the the great artistic lighting. There's pens. And, This was mid '90s, early '90s. I can't recall exactly the year. I think、But、you're not, about it's right. It's been a while. It's、back. been a、yeah. while.、Um, Before he got into the Blade films. Yes. Okay. And there's rows of drawings in the background in such a sexy image that he actually has sex on a drafting table. Oh, okay. So that's a that's a unique take. And you know, you walk into a lot of these architecture offices now and don't even see drafting tables. It's true. You don't even see the iconic drafting lamp much. Obviously, most of our work is on computers.、Mm -hmm. I still have a drafting <laughs> lamp. I still draw by hand. But it's interesting that, that you say that because most movies today, when they show an architect's office, it's still what it looked like ten, twenty years, years ago. Twenty years ago. Because it still looks great to see drafting tables and rows of drawings and only a few computers. Well, there's a movie that has just come out here in February. With Rebel Wilson, a romantic comedy where she plays an architect, and architecture has kind of a central role in the film in that they show a lot of scenes in her office,、mm -hmm. and they show her at home, but she has that drafting table right in her apartment. You have to have the drafting yeah. table. Yeah, I think that's just part of the allure. I think in a lot of these movies, particularly romances, they want the male lead or female lead to be a creative type, to be、yeah. artistic. But the artistic person also has to have a job. 
<laughs> I don't think the movies would work if you were a starving poet on the street corner or a musician playing saxophone in the subway station. So being an architect allows that lead role to be romantic, creative, and still have a job, so it's a respectable profession. Do you know the movie The Lake House? Of course. Keanu that, Reeves. That's one of my favorites. And his brother and his dad all play architects. Now, it's funny. Their company was called Paradigm, which is kind of a odd name for, for an architect office. You remember that little piece of trivia. I, I believe I have that right. Maybe <laughs> another movie, but I think that's correct. Uh, I love that, that movie. It's fun. They actually have architectural discussions. The three of them, he lives in a, a glass house floating on a lake. And they often show him at his uh, drafting table with his white T-shirt, working late hours, drawing away, coming up with some creative vision for the world. Yeah. Do you know the story of that house, that glass house? I don't, no. So Is it a real house? It, it was a real house. They built it in, I think, a natural wildlife area. And in order to get permission to do that, mm -hmm. they had to agree to take it down once it was built. Wow. So they built this really incredible glass house in this beautiful scenery. Right. And uh, Sandra Bullock, who was in the movie, was bemoaning the fact that it all had to go away when it was <laughs> over. I mean, she, she just couldn't stand it. But they had to take it apart. That's too bad. And take it out. She should have bought it with she all the money she, she made she from should have a bought classic it. movie. Uh, that was the big returning sequel, I think, to uh, the one on the bus that they did together. Speed. Speed, yeah. Right. Now, of course, he didn't play an architect. No. Keanu Reeves played a cop, and it's an action movie. I don't think it would have worked if he played a, an architect no. in that movie. <laughs> right. But they were a great uh, cinematic couple. How has architecture changed in terms of use in film? Has it changed much at all? Is it heading in the direction where maybe we'll see more computer screens in the scenes? Or do you think they're still going to hold on to that notion? of? I think they are holding on to that notion because it's a, it's a trope and it's a formula that works. Mm. I think they're aware that the industry has changed. There's corporate companies, there's, there's many types of people in architecture, there's technology, as we said, the entire office and setup is different. But Hollywood is about creating fantasy and images, and I think that's still a role that people view architects as. I don't think it's always accurate, but it's consistent in movies. It has been for decades since the first black and white movies in the 30s all the way up to today. That's how they represent architects in it, and it works. If the field of architecture was gone, I don't know if Hollywood could find another type of character that is a mix of creativity and professionalism, a mix of nobility and, and, and seriousness. I wonder if they'll remake The Fountainhead again. I wish they did. I actually wish they did a dramatic version of Frank Lloyd Wright's life. Ah, if you think about that movie, it would be a movie about ego, power, ambition, sex, arrogance. There would be the great buildings and the backdrops and the stories, and there would be the climactic scene where, if you're familiar with Frank Lloyd Wright's extended family that were all killed, chopped oh, yes, to when pieces they were murdered. by an axe murderer that was one of his employees at a house. Yeah. That, would, that would be a great, horrific, but dramatic Hollywood scene, and it's all true. I wonder if somebody's working on that. I've been thinking I should write a screenplay. I should yeah. partner with someone, put that together. There are plenty of biographies. Of Lots Frank of Lloyd documentaries Wright. about All of his it. life. But, but never no one's a... made it a dramatic screenplay. The question is, who would play Frank Lloyd Wright? There'd be a lot of people that could be I, great for it, but I don't I, know. Benedict Cumberbatch comes to mind. He's good in most anything. He could he probably is pull good. it off. He's probably too tall, since Frank Lloyd <laughs> Wright is known to be very short. Oh, that's right. He was short, wasn't he? It's funny that I always think a lot of the success of his homes is because he's short. People would say these homes are so comfortable. What a great scale. Mm -hmm. It's so intimate feeling. And I'm thinking, well, maybe because he's just so short that these rooms have this proportion. Maybe so. Yeah. Well, outside of, of pursuing this interest, Anthony, you've also been chasing this holy grail of figuring out a way to make uh, nice, small, modernist houses affordable. Correct. And, and how have you done that? Because I've seen a lot of people try to do this, and it always ends up being way out of control budget-wise. We have been very lucky, very fortunate, very successful. We first have teamed with a developer named Andrew Adler, who was passionate about design and uh, knew that we together had to break the mold. 
The way that these homes meet a budget is by being very elemental with what makes good architecture. Meaning, we look at proportion, we look at natural light, we look at an open floor plan, connections indoor to outdoor. We don't spend time on what you usually see in the track housing industry. Niches, hallways, endless corridors, atriums, all that kind of space isn't necessary anymore. What our demographic seeks is quality over quantity. Right. It's not about the 10,000 square foot house, the 20,000 square foot house. It's not even about the five or 6,000 square foot house. If you design a good, clear, modern house that is, say, 2,500 square feet, three bedroom, it can feel twice that size, which was something Neutro was famous for, and it could be an efficient house. We've designed it uh, with construction techniques that are very unique to the track housing industry, and it's cut costs dramatically. We've been able to get homes built for about one-fourth to one-third the cost of a typical custom home. Really? What is construction costs on average in California now? For uh, single family a single-family home, uh, at least in our office, we're seeing 400, 500, and okay. up. And of course, they it can go up as, as high as a thousand dollars, yes, as high as you want. But 400, 500 dollars a square foot in Southern California gets you a, a nice custom home. You can squeeze it down to maybe a little under 400, but that's yeah. about as tight as it can get. So your model for this is getting it down to what, like 150 or even, 200? Even less. Really? Yeah. Uh, depending on the size, depending on the location. Uh, most of these are in Palm Springs, depending on the, the subcontractors we use. But yes, they're in that range. So you've done about 200, is that uh, right? We just built and sold our 224th home wow. in four years. Okay. So this is, this is a, a great track record we have so far. I assume they're in some neighborhoods where they're clustered together, right? They are in four different communities that we have built out. Okay. And they vary from a community in South Palm Springs with only 14 homes to a community called Asina, which is near the Palm Springs airport with 130 homes. We take the model of track housing where we build a couple prototypes and do variations on it. And once we kind of get that perfected, they multiply out with slight different details to give a, a sense of variety. But it is the track housing idea where you create a, a very pristine and perfect formula and, and repeat that over and over again. So are these, these have any uh, shared amenities? Like are they around a pool or can people put their own pools in the backyard or are they too small for the house to work? They all come with pools. Oh, they do. Okay. We, we have studied and realized you cannot sell a spec home in Palm Springs without a pool. Okay. That's a must. The Asina all works around the Asina public golf course. Okay. So that, that's a big setting there. One of our communities called Montesorino uh, is adjacent to the Indian Wells golf course. Okay. Another one we've done in La Quinta is next to PGA West. So golfing is sort of what is uh, central Driving here. it all, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's what we try to, to work with. Well, that's amazing. What's the next frontier for you? I mean, you've, you've conquered this one. What's next? In general? Yeah. We are, at my office, interested in almost anything. We explore projects from education to sacred buildings, from commercial to retail and restaurants. I think right now, one of the things that we really are interested in is religious structures, sacred buildings. Well, I was having a conversation with someone last night, now, so I'll, I'll relay this question to you. Okay. So I know that there are a lot of churches, Catholic churches, Episcopal churches, right. uh, Lutheran churches, Methodist there are a number of modernist synagogues, but I haven't know of any modernist mosque yet. Are they coming along? I don't think so yet. Yeah. That's a fascinating topic. Uh, I need to do a little bit of research. Yeah. What, what we have been working with, uh, which we didn't list in that, is Buddhism. Oh, okay. Uh, we've completed our fourth Buddhist building. Uh, two of them are temples. They're in Virginia. And, and it's interesting because we were just talking about... Where is there a Buddhist temple in Virginia? It's outside of Roanoke. Really? They have a 400... That's like Jerry Falwell country up there. <laughs> they have a 400-acre campus that we've been working with them with a master plan and building out project by project. A cabin, a temple, a reliquary structure. We're working on a, a dining hall soon. Okay. More cabins, hopefully a dormitory, a visitor center. We have all sorts of uh, buildings planned. Uh, it's a nonprofit, so it's it's based on funding and, and donations. As they get acquired, we build the next building. And it's fascinating because it's 
a very different approach to architecture. It's, it's looking at a kind of architecture that is so quiet and so introspective and introverted, you might not even think that, that these buildings are that special. In fact, if you see them and you tell me, this doesn't really look like much, I would almost say that's exactly the point. These are not structures meant to, to be on the front page of magazines. They're, they're not Frank Gehry buildings. Right. Uh, but they are very strong statements of design, mostly in their modesty and their simplicity. One of the Buddhist temples we've done, you can't tell if it was built 500 years ago or built last year. Because Where is that one? This is also in Virginia. Okay. We employed the traditional methods of heavy timber construction and mortise and tenon meaning that the entire building, other than the foundation, was made by hand without any modern tools. And there are no screws and no nails in an entirely wood construction. Every connection is mortise and tenon and pegged by wood. How is that possible in this day of detailed building codes and things like that? How do you do that? We, we have worked <laughs> with, with local engineers. We've worked with local builders. We can show that it is safer, even safer, than buying a hardy pano or, or welding a moment frame. Yeah. And uh, it's fantastic. We've, we've worked with a couple people who are familiar with this technique. It's all community built, so everyone was taught how to cut wood, how to sand, how to make this connection, and it was all raised out of the ground by a community of, of, of Buddhists. It's a, a fantastic project. Are they taking the wood from the property and processing it, or is that too complicated? In some cases, yes. Okay. They, they are taking down trees and using that, that wood, and that's just a way of honoring the land. In other sure. situations, they are bringing in some lumber. Sure. Wow, that, that's amazing. Yeah, it's a that's com really it's completely different kind of thing because the housing that we do, it's great that we're reaching out to an entire new demographic that's seeking modern homes. They are built spec. They are built for a developer. It is a business and built for profit, and now we're going the other way building for someone who's just looking for a space to nurture their soul. Yeah. To just to just meditate and be silent for, for a few days. Well, Anthony, it's been a real pleasure talking with you. I think we're going to be hearing a lot more about you in the coming I years. hope so. Thanks. Thank you very much. Stay tuned. There's still more. George is going to talk next with Jacques Cossin, one of the originators of Palm Springs Modernism Week, about the origins of the entire modernism movement in architecture back in the early 20th century. You know, before the internet. Modernism Week is just, it's a, it's a thing now. It's approaching that grandeur of scale of major California events. It's a thing with a capital T, indeed. Yeah, it is, it is just unbelievable how it has grown and how many people are fascinated by it and how many more people come every year. It's just, it's just wonderful. It started out and it was fairly small. It was like a couple hundred people, I think, in the beginning. Yes, yes. It was, it, it was just totally amazing. We had, I remember the first or second year when we started the, doing the double-decker bus tour we had hired a um, company from L.A. We did three tours, and then they sold out. So the following year, we said, let's do it. So we booked him for seven tours. Of course, they sold out. And I believe last year, if I'm not mistaken, they had somewhere between 60 and 70 tours altogether. Holy cow. Yes, indeed. And describe for our listeners these buses, what they look like and what people do when they're on them. It's a it's a typical uh, London like double decker tour bus and people go for two and a half hours through town. There's a tour guide who describes them each of the major buildings and they go through both neighborhoods and industrial area and also of course all the public buildings, the downtown and everything of significance as we have. But Modernism Week is of course more than tours. What are some of the hundreds of things people can choose from while they're here. Well, you know, by now, if there is a house of any interest that was built before 1965, there will be a party at that house <laughs> at some point during Modernism Week. <laughs> I guess the caterers are happy this week. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. It's hot. And the restaurants as well. I tried last night 
to make a reservation at one of the better restaurants here when I have friends from out of town and they say they, they just laughed at me. They say, are you kidding? You should have done that three months ago. Palm Springs is also famous for a film festival that you have here every year? Early January, indeed. Now, is that bigger or smaller than Modernism Week? Frankly, I cannot tell because, you know, the, the, the official, the way uh, the number of attendees is computed, which is um, something all over the country, it's just one way of doing it, and it's basically how many people attend the event. So if you go to see 10 movies, you're going to count as 10 attendees. 10 tickets, right. 10 yeah. tickets. So, and the same with Palm Springs. So it's really difficult to compare the two events in that regard. And also, the film festival attracts a lot of retired local people. We do Modernism Week does get a lot of out-of-towners and actually from the entire world nowadays. Yes, you get a, a huge number, I understand, from Canada and Australia. Australia is just amazing. I know of, of, of three people, they have come here every single February since 2006. <laughs> I mean, hello, that wonderful. Annalisa Capiro must be one of those. <laughs> Indeed, she is. You know her too, then. Yes. <laughs> and she's great, and her enthusiasm is just phenomenal. She's been a guest on the show a couple times. Oh, good. Yeah. Excellent, oh, yeah. excellent, as she should be. What is the headcount for last year? How many people bought tickets, do you think, approximately? I've heard I'm, it was around 90,000, yeah, 95,000. Very likely, very likely. I know that this year they have 350 different events throughout the 11 day. That's a lot to keep track of. Indeed, yeah. I, mean, I think they have something called computers. And yeah, that, and computers. That helps, them, that helps them count and get organized. Didn't the Eames invent those? I think. <laughs> no, not that. <laughs> Could be, yes. No, not quite. <laughs> Speaking of, of modernist history, I know the Eames, and before that, there was Mies van der Rohe. And before that, I think there was Moses. But you know a little bit more <laughs> about the beginnings of modernism, and you're giving a talk about it here during Modernism Week. So tell us how this fabulous movement got going. Well, it really started in the 30s. I mean, to me, the, the modern design was born in the 30s, after the Depression, because there was a need for something new. The manufacturers needed to sell their products, and... They finally, they had finally realized that it was only the difference, the visual difference between two items that would make one item sell versus the other one, which is a, a no-brainer, but back then apparently it was not. So that's when the job of industrial designer was created. And we have many industrial designers, of course, from the 30s. Also, what happened at that time is that all the nationalistic movements started in Europe, whether it was Mussolini in Italy or Hitler, of course, in Germany. So a lot of the designers, people who had interest in design and architecture, they were no longer welcome in their own country or they politically they just didn't want to right. deal with it. So they moved away and they came to America. So the influence of European designers is very, very essential in the birth of industrial design. Well, who were some of those first designers that you're going to be talking about? Well, there was one, for example, Kem Weber, who was Austrian. His name, he Americanized his name Kem, but he was Carl Emanuel Martin Weber. There is Paul Frankel. There is Wolfgang Hoffman, who was Joseph Hoffman's own son. He and his wife moved to America. There were many very influential people, like Miss van der Rohe, for example, who was very important because he was the first one to design a chair made out of metal tubular in 1927. And then he was followed by other guys who did similar design. And then he came here. And because he was already known when he arrived in America, he immediately got a very significant and highly regarded job. And he ended up being the head of the Harvard School of Design. And then another one went to the Illinois School of Design. So all these people, when they arrived in this country, got very influential jobs right away. And then in, in another case, for example, at MoMA in New York, Elliot Noyes, 
who was a curator of architecture and design, his major mentor was Walter Gropius. So, ah, sure. you know, uh, that's how the, the, the European uh, infiltrated the country here. Did modernism catch on right away? Was everybody buying pieces or was it kind of a small interest? No, among it, the it, it took off relatively quick because mainly um, because of the World's Fair in New York in 1939. Oh, all right. The, all the people who came to the fair came to, they were exposed to all that new stuff and they realized that, yes, maybe indeed the new design were not necessarily for an artsy elite or the, the moneyed people and whatnot. It, it said, well, we can live with it. And of course, after World War II, development of suburbia, etc., made it very, made it a perfect match with the kind of modern furniture, modern design, because it was lightweight, it was cheap to, you know, you could move it around the room or around the town, you know, very easily. Were the items that were most popular, do they tend to be furniture or housewares or dishes, or what was all the rage when modernism was getting going? Well, in the 30s, every room was, uh, so, was influenced by the, by the new design, whether it was the thermostat on the wall or a tea kettle or a vacuum cleaner or, of course, furniture. Later, after the war, all the household items had already sort of been set design-wise, and it was mostly furniture that changed, and a bit like fashion, you know, you have to create new things and, and, and whatnot to stay relevant, or sure. pretend, pretend you're relevant. Sure. <laughs> Did any of the major retailers pick up on this at the time and run with it? From the very beginning, from the very beginning, all the department stores got on the bandwagon, because they saw that it was profitable for them. It was a way to sell more, of course. You know, you have to, if you have something new, well, you have to tell your clients that it's new, you must have it. The big department stores, I would think, like Gimbel's, Gimbel's Macy's, Kaufman's yeah. in Philadelphia. Abraham and Strauss and all the people. And, for example, one designer, one famous designer, Raymond Lowy, who had started as a fashion illustrator, ended up being an industrial designer, and he knew all of these people, because what we know, the department store, the name, like Saks or Gimbal or Bonwick Teller, these were actual people. It was Louis Gimbal, it was Horace Saks, and they were actual people. So Louis met all of these and had excellent rapport. And, and so the, the prominence of modern items you could buy also ran in parallel with modern design like Lowy's logos and sure of and course of course totally and uh, Lowy designed a lot of items and at the same time he was recreating brands visually and product wise so by the 50s there was so much out there in the marketplace that was considered modern yeah, it was, uh, that was the only thing. I mean, you know, there were collectors who would buy early American, of course, there was and there will always be. But young couple, I mean, buying a new house in the suburbs, in Levittown or wherever, had to have the modern furniture and they embraced it. And it's so funny because I remember growing up and being in those houses and not really realizing, of course, you know, when you're six, you don't know what you're sitting on you're just sitting on it. But I, I could always tell there was something special about that furniture, the way the adults related to it, because it was not just like another couch that got thrown into a house. No, absolutely, absolutely. And of course, you know, you, we all have the visuals of the perfect housewife, you know, sitting on her Eames chair, you know, <laughs> with, that, with that special skirt. And it was, it was a whole era. And there was a, a, a there was there was an excitement about being modern and if you were not that modern you were sort of not necessarily considered hip and of course after that 30 years later we all buy the furniture that we grew up with so that's why the 60s and the now the 70s or 80s even are coming back in uh, in fashion and uh, at that time we said well maybe there is nothing new but there is always something new yes it's interesting to me now watching kids in their 30s long for the 90s movies 
they want to see the 90s movies over and over again that they grew up with. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I'm not sure about the furniture, though, what we call refer to as millennials or not collectors. No? The same way. I don't think so. I don't, I don't see that. And there is, there is less interest in the childhood furniture from these guys than they were 30 years ago from the, from the same age group at, at that time. There was lots of people coming from Europe. What about the people that stayed behind in Europe? Did you explore people like Adolf Loesch at all or some of those like super early modernists? Well, they, they continued their career and then they had, a, they had a big time during the war. You know, the war started in 39 in Europe and ended in 44. Here the war only started with Pearl Harbor in 41. Right. So that's two years that were very critical in terms of the evolution of design. So the ones who stayed in, New, in Europe really suffered for a long time and eventually by the time money came back and taste you know people got excited about having new things these guys were a little bit many of them were sort of out of fashion out of the picture mm -hmm. and it was brand new uh, level of designers a lot came from it started to come from Italy which didn't happen before the war. The, before the war, it was it was French or German or Austrian, but after the war, the Italy started starting to be very big. Yeah, the Italian modern furniture industry is huge, 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 and still manages to be huge. Yeah, <laughs> in fact, looking forward, what do you see is the next big thing in modernist design, Jock? I mean, you've got this whole perspective on it. What's coming at us? <laughs> uh, I cannot answer, you can, you frankly. Can, you can I can see, I see um, a, a lack of interest in, to some extent from the, from the very younger generation. So it's the possessing goods is not as relevant as it was 30, 40 years ago. I mean, it's all about, you know, you rent now. You, you rent whatever you need. You, you know, you, you don't want to buy a fur coat, God forbid. If you really want a fur coat, you're going to rent it because you hmm. have an event to attend. Or also the fact that you can return things so easily. So you want to impress your neighbors for your farewell party or when you get in your engagement party, well, you rent and then you return it the next day. So well, the, I'm the, sure the concept of owning is really very different nowadays. I'm sure they, they have Netflix for movies. And they have subscription services for clothing. You yes, can order absolutely. off for clothing and send it back later. I'm sure someone's thought of this for modern furniture. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And there is, I don't know, there's rental, you can rent furniture for anything you need, basically, nowadays. Yeah. Even for your wedding night. Oh, oh yes, you can get everything you want. <laughs> Well, Jacques, thank you so much for coming back and talking with us, and good luck on your talk. My very pleasure. Thank you so much, and it's good seeing you, George. Thank you much. Thanks for listening. Want to hang out with U.S. Modernist at Modernism Week in February next year? Send an email to george at usmodernist.org with your name and phone number. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by... Angela Roll, your special agent for Modernist Houses. 919-995-0550. Okay, take us out, Tom. Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows, discover documentation of 7,000 significant modernist houses, and access two and a half million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song is performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. Cindy Stratton, not her real name, researches guests from her secret underground lair. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild. George, and I'll be back soon with another Modernism Week edition of U.S. Modernist Radio. Modernist Radio.